you are invited to take part in the first ever Stromlo Church Memory Verse Challenge. Be as creative as you want using any medium. The only rule is that you have the words to 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 at the end somewhere in your work and not printed from a computer. Send your clips and photos to kids at stromlo.org. You do not need to be a kid to enter. Good morning. Welcome to Stromlo Christian Church Online. I'm Elise and it's great to have you join us this morning. Today we're continuing our look at the theme of who will be king. We're in the book of 1 Samuel, which looks at the story of the prophet Samuel and his role in the beginning of Israel's monarchy about 3,000 years ago. Last week, we looked at Israel's request for a king and God's decision to grant it. This week, we're looking at their very first king, the well-known King Saul. The Bible describes him as impressive and a head taller than all the other Israelites and without equal among the Israelites. But he also comes from Israel's smallest tribe and what is described as the least important clan in that tribe. Saul is a chosen one. He is picked out from all the Israelites to be their first king. But while things start out promising, unfortunately, he is not everything the Israelites wanted. The strength and stability they sought from a king doesn't come from King Saul. Let's look at the rise and fall of King Saul. Let's pray. Father God, be with Paul as he brings us insight into the word that you've given us from 1 Samuel about kingship. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to act as you will. Amen. Hi, everybody. Please join us in singing praises to our King, Death Defeated and Jesus Has Risen. Oh 
think he's alive. Praise the King that's defeated. Hallelujah, he's alive. Praise the King. The Stromlo Kids Creative Challenge is here. Retell a story or explore a theme from 1 Samuel in a creative way. Send it to kids at stromlo.org so we can all enjoy your hard work. Hi Stromlo friends, Dan Evers here, lead pastor of Stromlo Christian Church. I'd like to take a couple of moments to talk briefly about our transition out of COVID-19 as a church family. Firstly, though, I want to say a big thank you to all of you who have been so prayerful and supportive and encouraging uh, and have worked so hard to make our move to online church such a success. Now, many of you have already heard of the three-staged proposal from the government about easing the restrictions. And uh, many of us have been thinking about how we can now move back to be a uh, normal church again. But we know that it's going to be a new normal, isn't it? And it's likely that the road back is going to be a long one. It's going to be a slow one. There's going to be speed bumps along the way. And it's likely we'll make a few mistakes and learn some lessons as we journey together. But as we head down this road, we as a Stromlo Church leadership, we want to be thought out and deliberate and be considerate of those who are part of our church as we make this transition. So as we do, uh, I'd ask you to be prayerful. Please pray for me and pray for the other leaders and the staff team as we work hard to uh, plot out this roadmap ahead. Secondly, uh, let me invite you to give feedback uh, to be people who are uh, eager to give your thoughts and your input. And we'd love to consider uh, how it is that you think that we should make this transition together. Thirdly, let me encourage you and appeal with you to be patient and to be considerate and loving as some of you will feel like we're moving too fast. Uh, some will feel like we're moving way too slow and we need to be loving and thoughtful uh, of one another. Uh, we need to be creative and thinking about how within the restrictions we can continue to meet together. Uh, we can continue to love each other and to uh, interact and connect. Uh, but in this, we need to be wise, don't we? Now, many of you have shared with me your longing to get back to, to be a church family, uh, to meet again in person. 
and I'm uh, delighted at this longing. I, I share this longing. I really miss seeing you face to face. And uh, it's, it's a longing that is a good thing, uh, that we should be back together as a church family. But the advice that we've been given, as I have met with uh, other senior pastors and heard from our national director, Al Stewart, uh, in regards to what lies ahead, it's likely that it will be still a long while before we can meet as a church gathering on a Sunday. Uh, it could be uh, up until Christmas or the end of the year before we could meet uh, in person. Uh, but as restrictions, restrictions are eased, uh, we'll be able to meet in some smaller groups and be able to uh, have some smaller gatherings. God willing, we hope that things like Ultimate and, and our life groups can meet uh, all together uh, face to face once again soon. But friends, as we do this, again, let's be people who are prayerful. Let's be people who are willing to share our feedback and our thoughts. Uh, please do that. And let's be people who are kind and considerate, loving one another, knowing that uh, this adjustment is going to be a challenging one for many. And in all this, let's remember that God is still on his throne, uh, that Jesus is still the King of Kings, and that this has not taken him by surprise. So we can keep trusting in him. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that you are on your throne, that Jesus is the King of Kings, and Lord, that we can trust you, that you are in control. Lord, help us to be wise as we move forward. Help our church leadership and help me as the senior pastor to make wise and loving decisions in this time of transition. Lord, we long for more people to come to know you, to fellowship together and to be supporting and building each other up as the body of Christ. Lord, help us to know how to do that wisely, to be considerate of one another. And Lord, we ask that in all this, that your kingdom would go forward and that more people in Malonglo and Canberra and in your world would know more of the loving and saving work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we also ask that you would be with us as we hold our church AGM a little bit later uh, today. Lord, we ask that in the light of the AGM, that you would guide our decisions. Lord, that you would excite us with what's ahead as we think about the future of our church. And Lord, that we would have hearts of thankfulness for what you have done over the last 12 months and the many blessings and many good things uh, that you have done in our church family. Lord, we pray for the formation of a new church council. Lord, that you would raise up the right leaders uh, to be part of that team. Uh, that would work shoulder to shoulder to see your kingdom grow and your son Jesus glorified. Lord, we pray for uh, the finances of our church and ask that uh, you would raise up the right amount of money so that uh, ministry endeavors can be funded and financed properly. And Lord, we pray for us, us as a church family that we would get behind the ministries of Stromlo, that we would uh, be motivated by your gospel and the need to see the lost saved and your kingdom grow. Father, we also pray for Charles Weston School, the school that we typically on a Sunday uh, were able to meet in. Lord, we ask that you would keep the relationship between Stromlo Church and the school strong. Lord, we pray for Nicole Nicholson as she, the principal of that school, uh, navigates uh, that school through, again, the changes and the transition of COVID-19. Lord, that you would strengthen her and the other senior staff there. Uh, Lord, that they would be able to do their job well, caring for the educational needs and the well-being of those children in that school. And Lord, may it be a place where uh, we might be able to proclaim Jesus through Christian education and support uh, that school as we partner with them. And Father, we uh, come before you with humble dependence, knowing that we should acknowledge you as the true King. And this morning, as we think about uh, the kingship in 1 Samuel, uh, Lord, that may it direct us uh, to allow you to be the ruler and Lord of our lives. And Father, as the Apostle Paul prays, we also pray that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen us with power through your spirit, that in our inner beings, Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And Lord, we pray that we would be rooted and established in love, and that we would have together with all your holy people, 
to grasp how wide and how long, how high and how deep is the love of our Saviour Jesus Christ. And that we may know the love that surpasses all knowledge and that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And we pray in the knowledge that you are able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work within us. To you, Lord, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. After our 9.30 service, we'll continue to look back as a church family as we hold our 2020 AGM over Zoom. In this time, you'll hear updates from the senior pastor and the treasurer, we'll vote on council members, we'll come before God in prayer, and there'll be a chance for you to ask some of your questions. So if you're committed to Stromlo as a church, then please join us.
Sam the dog. In case you were wondering, this is my cubby. Do you like it? It's nice you could join me. Let me show you something. Sam, it's dinner time. Hmm, did you hear something? I thought I did, but nah. So anyway, this is my cubby and this is my toy ducky. It makes a squeaking sound. Well, it's meant to. Um, Sam, did you hear me? It's hmm. dinner time. I thought maybe I heard something then, but nah. I'm going to ignore it because look, here are my friends, Eddie and Claire. Eddie, Claire, can I play with you? Yes. Come over here. Sam, I know you can hear me. Claire, Come on. Yeah. can I play with you? Yeah. Come up here, let's play with some toys. Yes. I thought I heard something again just then, but no, I'm going to play with you guys instead. Yes, here. Thanks. Oh, that's great. That looks great. Hmm. I'm getting really, really hungry though, but I really like playing with you guys. I'm really comfy in my cubby. Hmm. We, we but my tummy's starting to hurt. I'm so hungry. Sam, for the last time, listen to my voice. It's dinner time. Oh, I'm so hungry. I thought I heard something then, but I can't even move now. I'll just drag myself back into my cubby and wait and see if I get some dinner later. Well, hi there, my name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Stromlo Church. And I wanna ask you, whose voice do you listen to? Who's the boss of your life? Who's in charge? We've just met Sam the dog, of course, and he was failing the, to listen to the voice of his master. It was pretty lighthearted, of course, but let's bring it home to us. Whose voice is loudest for you? I think about myself, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to live with Jesus as my King by His grace. I'm trying to listen to God and His Word as the ultimate influence in my life. But in my natural state, I know what I'm like. I'm the boss. I want to be in charge. I listen to my own voice. That's what I tend towards anyway, because I'm a rebel at heart. But it's not as black and white as that. In my weakness, sometimes God is just hard to trust. Hard to listen to, hard, hard to obey. His will for my life sometimes doesn't match my desires or doesn't fit my circumstances or doesn't seem fair or isn't happening quickly enough. So I get impatient and in no time at all, I can turn to another voice. Well, why am I talking about this? Well, these are some of the controlling ideas running through the book of 1 Samuel and particularly the story of Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul is this complex man, a mixed bag of a character, some highs, but a dark and tragic conclusion that we'll get to. And we'll have to ask, where did it all go wrong? And we'll see that Saul's major problem is this. In the end, Israel's king Saul does not listen to the voice of God. How about I pray? Lord God, we ask that today, as we open your scriptures, we will hear your voice and we will obey for our good and for your glory. Amen. 1 Samuel is all about the search for a leader. These are early days for Israel. God is their leader. He's their king. God is looking after them. We've seen that. But they don't see it. They want a leader just like those big powerful nations around us, thank you very much. It's sinful, yes, but incredibly God allows it. He will give them a human king, but God has his own reasons. God will give them a king to build God's kingdom for God's good purposes. And to do this, God will find a king after his own heart. Now Samuel has been leading well. But he's old and his sons are dodgy, so it's crunch time. Who will lead Israel? Enter Saul. This is the rise of Saul. Who is Saul? Verse 2. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. Stromlo Church, meet Fabio. Meet your Bachelor of the Year. Meet the handsome, tall Saul. He's like Prince Charming, or as we'll see, probably more like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. 
if you know your Disney movies. Now, Saul doesn't know where his life is going. We don't know yet. But what an introduction. This is a handsome, impressive man. What happens next? Well, Saul goes on a, a great donkey chase. Verse 3, now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. Oh no. And Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. Ah, oh, Saul, he's such a good boy, isn't he? He listens to the voice of his dad. But on this wild donkey chase, Saul is kind of an airhead. He's clueless. Most of us aren't great at ancient Israelite geography, and fair enough. Uh, so we miss a bit of the detail here, but this journey is apparently quite ridiculous. Uh, Saul goes way off track. He goes off into the mountains, up, off, around and down for miles and miles, probably off course. He means well. He's listening to his dad, but he's clueless. I mean, it'd be like your mum asking you to buy milk from the local IGA and you end up in Goulburn. That's not all though. Saul is passive. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, come, let's go back or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, look, in this town there is a man of God. He's highly respected and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to go. Can you see where this is going? Saul is about to meet someone in this town. Who do you think it is? And Saul's life is never going to be the same when he meets the prophet Samuel in this town. But notice something else. Who takes the initiative here? Who tells Saul to meet the man of God? Not Saul. Saul's just thinking about the donkeys and going home. The servant takes the initiative. Saul listens to the voice of his servant. It's a bit of a red flag. Now, I don't want to be too negative yet. Saul is a faithful obedient, impressive Fabio. He looks good. Israel wants a king like this. God wants a king after his own heart. And so we ask, could this be the one? Saul indeed enters the town and guess who he meets? Samuel. And guess what has happened? Samuel has been told by God. God has revealed to Samuel that he will meet a man this day who will be anointed king. And it's Saul. See, Saul is God's chosen one. So Samuel anoints Saul in secret until finally we get to our first Bible reading for today when Saul is finally announced as king to the whole nation. And we're going to read from chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. Let's read. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. And I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, No, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out, and as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of the kingship, he wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. 
But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. So we saw in those verses, didn't we? The big moment arrives. Samuel gathers Israel together. It's time to reveal God's chosen one. What happens? Well, you saw what happened, didn't you? In verse 20, the lot, of course, lands on Saul. If there was any doubt that he was the chosen one, they're all removed here. Israel, here is your king. Here he is. Come on out. Wait, where is he? Verse 21, he is MIA, missing in action. They ask God where Saul is, and God tells them, verse 22, he's hiding in the supplies. Literally, he's hiding in the stuff. Now, my family, during isolation, been doing lots of things to try and, and pass the time. And one thing we've been doing is occasionally making box forts and castles with sheets and pillows and that kind of thing. My kids love hiding in there. Well, Israel's supposed new king is hiding in a box fort, like a cheeky little kid. I don't think Saul is just being humble here. He's reluctant. He's a bit of a wimp. See, God chose him. Samuel anointed Saul. Samuel's voice, God's voice, should be ringing in Saul's ears. But what is he doing hiding in the stuff? Well, out he comes finally. They have to run and force him out. Can you imagine Saul's expression? Oh, yeah, sorry. I was, uh, I was just checking on this um, stuff. But out he comes. And Israel loves their Fabio. Wow, he is a head taller than anyone else. Wow, he was so handsome. Wow, thanks, God. Good choice. And so in verse 24, they shout, long live the king. It gets even better. In chapter 11, Saul's reign rises and rises, and it starts with a bang, really. Please read it yourself, chapter 11. But to summarize, the Israelites are under threat. Uh, the brutal Ammonites are threatening them. And so Israel cries out for help. And who answers the call? 11 verse 6, Saul. Well, God through Saul. The Spirit of God rushes on Saul and Saul rises to the occasion. Saul musters the troops of Israel and conquers the Ammonites in his first battle ever, which is an amazing victory. But as we read on, we need to wait and see how will Saul go? Will Saul listen to God's voice before all else? Will he submit to God as the true king? Before we do that, though, let's pause here and reflect. I'm blown away again by God's provision for his people, aren't you? In the Old Testament, God promised his people he would be faithful. He would establish his kingdom. He would bless the world through them. And despite their sin within, despite their enemies without, despite their soon-to-be dodgy kings, God is faithful. And God saves so he provides salvation when he provides a saviour. And friend, if you're a Christian, you know he's done that for us too, hasn't he? He has provided a saviour, even when we were his enemies. Romans 5 verse 10 reads in these amazing words, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? King Jesus saves us because God is a faithful God, faithful to his promises. Well, Saul is a shadow of Jesus, becoming King of Kings. Saul pales in comparison, not least because where Jesus succeeded through faithfulness and obedience to his father, Saul fails and fails miserably. But that doesn't mean God fails. Quite the opposite. And so let's have a look at the fall of Saul, secondly. The fall of Saul happens in three episodes. It's really three strikes and you're out for Saul. Three times where Saul's obedience to God's voice is put to the test. Who will he listen to? Well, we watch and we see as we read his story. I'd love you to read chapters 13 to 15, by the way, in your own time. They're really worth digging into. They're rich and there's more in there that I can really explain. The first episode, chapter 13, Saul's reign begins, but straight away Israel's in trouble. 
The Philistines are running rampant throughout the land. It becomes all-out war. Saul and his troops end up stuck in a, a town called Gilgal, under siege and surrounded. And I think of the troops in Dunkirk during World War II, if you've seen that film or know that story. It's a bit like that, and it's scary. Saul is scared. His troops are, are quaking with fear, where they're described in the verses. Many troops desert and run off. But all the while, Saul has had a word. He's had a word, a voice that should be ringing in his ears. In an earlier chapter, Samuel told Saul that this would happen and that he was on the way to help if Saul can wait seven days. In seven days, Samuel would come, would sacrifice to the Lord and would help. And so will Saul obey this voice? Well, to his credit, in 13 verse 8, we're told that Saul waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So then, Saul says, in verse 9, Bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. He did it himself. Verse 10, Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, of course, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. It's frustrating. It seems harsh, and... Saul's impatience is kind of understandable, right? But what's really going on here? King Saul, he should have listened to God's voice, shouldn't he? He should have sat under the authority of the true king, God. But notice who he doesn't mention next. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, then I thought I should sacrifice. See, which voice is loudest in Saul's ears? His own, his circumstances, the men scattering and absent Samuel, the Philistines with their swords and shields and chariots. All he can see are his circumstances. As scary as they are, as puzzling as God's command must be. But what's going on here? King Saul is relegating the voice of God, the true king. And in doing so, he becomes a fool. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, not the fear of your circumstances. And so Samuel calls Saul a fool, announces that Saul's reign will be short, and indeed that his sons will not follow him to the throne. Strike one. Pausing here quickly, this is Saul's story, not ours. So we need to be careful about how we apply this in our lives. But there is a principle, I think, for us. Sometimes God's clear commands in the Bible will be otherwise puzzling or frustrating for us. If you're a Christian, you'll open your Bible and you'll read God's will for you. Fight sin in your life. Indeed, kill sin in your life. Flee sexual immorality. Identify yourself in Christ, not in whatever you feel. Or forgive your enemy. It'll feel frustrating. It might even feel impossible. At that moment, whose voice will you listen to? We need the Spirit's help, don't we? I know I do. It's easy to follow God's voice when His will lines up with mine. It's tough when it doesn't. Well, that's strike one for Saul. Strike two is next. Even more briefly, in chapter 14, Saul and Israel are doing well against the Philistines. And Saul makes an oath that no one is allowed to eat anything until nightfall and, and the Philistines are destroyed. But then what happens? Uh, Saul's own son, Jonathan, eats some honey. And then that inspires the whole Israelite army to slaughter all these animals and eat the meat raw and bloody. They ignore King Saul's oath. And on top of that, they ignore God's law from earlier parts of the scriptures not to eat food with blood in it. They've done the wrong thing. And so what will Saul do? Will Saul be the strong, consistent leader and king that Israel need to establish themselves as a nation under God and his law? Will he follow through on his oath? Will he follow God's law? Unfortunately, no. Saul is, again, reluctant. 
He's weak-willed. He follows the voice of his subordinates. He gives his troops a slap on the wrist and spares his son Jonathan. Strike two. Strike three. And sadly, Saul's out. Chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, God gives an express command to Saul and the Israelites, clear as day, destroy the Amalekites, destroy them all. Israel and the Amalekites, they have a long history. Um, they're like Batman and the Joker, if you can think about it like that. The Amalekites were actually the first nation to try and wipe out Israel, way back when Israel left Egypt. They have a long history. Saul should know this, and he should know God's command given to him. But what does he do? 15 verse 7, Saul attacks the Amalekites, good start, defeats them, but he spares the king, Agag, and he spares the best animals. Does he listen to God's voice? No. And so the tragic moment arrives, 15 verse 10, God regrets making Saul king. God regrets it. Now, before we jump into a theological defense here and say theologically correct things like God doesn't change and God always planned for this to happen, all true, just feel the weight of this first. It's the same language that God used in the time of Noah and the ark. And so God regret, regrets Saul's leadership because he has come to embody rebellion against God, the king of his people. God tells Samuel that he must confront Saul. And Samuel is gutted. He prays all night. But then the moment arrives, verse 13. Saul, he's fancy free, isn't he? He just walks on over and he seems clueless again. He thinks he's done the right thing, nothing wrong. But he's deceived himself by his own sin. And he's about to face the music, isn't he? And probably with great pain in his heart, Samuel recalls Saul's journey from his donkey beginnings to this very day. And... And then he asks that fateful question in verse 19. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? So how does Saul respond? His response is an echo of Adam and Eve in the garden. Defending, blame shifting. See, first Saul tries to defend himself, but I did obey. And second, Saul shifts the blame. The soldiers, they took the plunder. Isn't this what we can all be like when faced with our sin? I know I'm capable of this. We make excuses, we defend ourselves, we shift the blame to our circumstances or our uncontrollable desires or anything else but me and my rebellious heart. Saul tries it. But what does it do? It creates a distance between Saul and God. See the language Saul used in that passage? Your God, Samuel. Your God. Saul is now distant, but he still tries to deny it, but Samuel won't have any of it. And so Samuel confronts him with the word of the Lord, sharper than any double-edged sword. Verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord... He has rejected you as king. See, verse 22, that first part there, this is what Saul has forgotten. God values simple obedience to his voice above Saul's fears, above Saul's sensibilities or Saul's tastes. And so because Saul has rejected God's voice and rejected God, Saul has been rejected by God. You see how the story ends? Finally, Saul admits his guilt he confesses his sin. He begs forgiveness. It's hard to know how genuine Saul is here, but tragically, it's too late. For God has chosen another in his place. God has chosen a king after his own heart, someone that we're going to meet next week. Well, friends, let's bring the story of Saul together and, and just ask again, where did it all go wrong? Saul started so well, didn't he? Where did it go wrong? Well, actually, the red flags were there from the start. And they became clearer and clearer as Saul's journey went on. Saul was not the king after God's own heart. 
He was not the king Israel needed or the king God wanted in the end. And this is why God removed him. God is not petty, by the way. God is not double-minded. He's not snappy and fickle like some of the new atheists like to make him out to be. That's not what he's like. In fact, the reason why God appointed Saul and the reason why God removed Saul are one and the same reason. And this is the reason. God wanted to build his kingdom. God wanted to preserve his people. God wanted to bless the world through Israel. God wanted to stay faithful to his promises. That is the reason. And so Saul started as the answer to those things. But tragically, in his sinfulness, he became an obstacle. And so for God to be faithful to his promises, to Israel, to the world, to us, Saul had to go. But where Saul failed, where king after king after king after Saul failed, one succeeded, didn't he? For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, resisting sin, resisting those voices around him, telling him, bow the knee, come down from the cross, save yourself. Jesus heard the voice of his father and he obeyed the voice of his father. He became the King of Kings and our eternal Saviour. Well, let's finish, friends, with two last reflections. Firstly, a word for church leaders. Saul's story is unique. I'm not saying that if you're a leader and you stuff up, God will reject you forever. You've got to be careful with this, right? But there is a principle here from the bad example of Saul. And this is it. When it comes to church leadership, God is not impressed with a handsome face or a likable personality or a people-pleasing attitude. Those can sometimes be an obstacle to true spiritual leadership. See, God wants leaders who listen to his voice above all others. Leaders who know his word intimately, who know him who are faithful to his word alone, no matter what the cost. Leaders who don't simply defer to the will of the people or cower before their circumstances or their culture or who get impatient. See, God wants leaders after his own heart, obedient to his voice, following the example of Jesus. Now, no church leader is Jesus. No church leader is perfect. But this is a call to pray for your leaders, isn't it? To value the right things in your leaders. Secondly and lastly, a word for us all. Whose voice do you listen to? How does God speak to you and I today? In the Bible, by His Spirit. At times, God's voice, as we open the Scriptures, will be hard to trust, hard to obey. It will be puzzling. It might take patience. But God's word ultimately always brings joy. After all, why does Jesus give us his word? He tells us, doesn't he, in John 15 verse 11, I have told you this, says Jesus, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for speaking into our lives. Even though we reject you, we listen to other voices. We pray that you would help us, again, even afresh today, to listen to your voice, to be people who submit to you as our King, obediently. We thank you for Jesus who has provided uh, our salvation from our own sin and our inability to follow your voice, who paid the penalty for us on the cross and rose again to new life so that we can have the hope of salvation, know that we are saved and will be saved and that you give us your spirit so that we can listen to you, follow your way, and receive your strength to do it. And so we ask again that you would help us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, Saul wasn't the perfect king that the Israelites hoped would save them, but Jesus is. Where Saul feared the people and disobeyed God, Jesus did neither. Through his life and his death and his return to life, Jesus opens the way to the perfect kingdom, where he is the perfect king. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We pray that you would bring us awe and joy at this gift. For those of us who don't know Jesus, we pray that you would reveal yourself. For those of us that do, we pray that you would make this gift new in our hearts every day. Amen. Well, just a reminder that our AGM is on directly after the service today via Zoom. Everyone is welcome to attend. You don't have to be a formal member to be there. Uh, it's a great chance to hear about what God has been doing through this church and to give him thanks for that. I look forward to joining you again next week. <laughs>